Cindy Kelly, Atomic Heritage Foundation, and I am in Ithaca, New York. It is Wednesday, June 11, 2014, and I have with me Rose Beta. And I'm going to start by asking Rose to tell us her name and spell it. My name is Rose Beta. It's spelled B as in boy, E, T as in Tom, H, E. Good. Um, all right, we're going to talk today a little about um, your life and your role in the Manhattan Project. So let's start with, um, tell us when, what year, what's your birthday, and, and uh, something about uh, where you were born and your parents. Well, <coughs> shall I start with the birthday? Because it fell, interestingly, for my arrival in Los Alamos. My birthday is on the 20th of March, and I was 26 years old then. So a few days after that, I left for for the West and uh, arrived in Los Alamos on probably about the 24th or 25th of March. I came from Boston where we had moved from Ithaca in the fall of 1942 because Hans, my husband, was to work at uh, MIT, and at the moment I forget the name of the project, the war project. The Radiation Laboratory? Was um, he working at the RAD Lab, so-called? Uh, no, lab not at the Met Lab. That was in no, Chicago. No, RAD, R-A-D? RAD, yes, RAD Lab. That's it. It was in, the, even the Rad Lab was still in its infancy. But it had been going for about a year, I suspect, because we had been there in May and it was in full swing then. But then we had other things to do and so we didn't return until the fall. And. Um, we rented an apartment in Cambridge, which had all black walls. It was quite eerie. And it was a very cold winter. So cold that standing, waiting for uh, the streetcar, I really felt that I was freezing solid. So we got a fur coat, a big fur coat made of you know, skunk pelts. And they still smelled a little of skunk, which was a great pleasure to my son later on. When he was about two and three, he would come and nuzzle into this. But for me, it was a lifesaver. And it was later on in Los Alamos as well, because while Los Alamos is very dry in contrast to Cambridge, you know, the cold is even fiercer than in Cambridge. But it isn't as disagreeable. So to go back to uh, going to Los Alamos, I had a ticket to go from Boston to Chicago and from Chicago on the Santa Fe uh, to Lamy. On the train, I met another person who was going west, and we both kind of hedged and hemmed about where we were really going to get off. But then, of course, we got off at the same place. 
and were met by the same people and driven the, what, 40 miles or something to, to Santa Fe. In Santa Fe, there was an office filled with people, telephones ringing, people typing away on various typewriters and um, discussing at the same time logistics. And they were very complicated logistics because the, you know, <coughs> you know, the housing in Los Alamos was by no means ready to receive the people who were coming. And they were coming at a terrific rate by that time. So you know, Oppenheimer, with the help of some local people, arranged for various ranches to receive the, the families when they came and the people, them, the, the men who were to work themselves. And they slept in the valley and were brought up to Los Alamos by buses every day. I was... You know, I had arrived without Hans, who was sick and had to stay in Boston for a few more days because Oppenheimer had you know, persuaded me to be the housing office. And I put it that way because the office was in a little hut and uh, didn't look like an office, whatever. It had one big filing cap, a uh, filing box in it, um. with all the names of the people who were coming and who were already there, and who needed houses. The houses were being erected at a great rate, so that about a month after we, after I came, the uh, the run. No, I think the ranches went on for quite a long time, but I don't remember exactly for how long. Some of the people were living on site in something called the Big House. The Big House was the dormitory of the boys' school, which had been Los Alamos until the army bought it and transformed it. It was not up to me who was to live on site and who was to live in the, in the valley. It was to some extent determined by whether people came with their families or came by themselves. And uh, some of, and if they came by themselves, we usually put off finding housing for them until we had housing available really ready to to go into the problem of course involved also getting these people fed and that was accomplished by turning the so-called fuller lodge into a dining room for I don't know a hundred or two hundred people, may have been even more. And um, I forget now her, her name, but Miss whatever, who had been the, um, uh, the nutritionist for the school, stayed on and now was faced suddenly not with growing boys and some of 70 or 100, I don't know how many there were, but with 200, 300, 400 uh, hungry, big men. And I think she found it very difficult to adjust portions <laughs> to uh, uh, feeding the slot. However, she managed, and everybody managed. And after a while, Hans arrived, 
and uh, he stayed with me for a little while, if I remember correctly, in Fuller Lodge, where I had a room. But then uh, I had found us a house at the outskirts of town where, uh, it, well, let me back up a bit. There were two uh, so-called childless units, and then one child units, and two child units, and that was it. No more than two children per family. At least no more than two sexes per family. Because we had to have two bedrooms because girls and boys couldn't sleep in the same room. Well, but, you know, rules is rules. So we, uh, I assigned us to one of the uh, two bedroom apartments because the one bedroom apartments ran out after about eight, eight of them. There were very, very few units for just childless families. And uh, we had in our unit a young scientist from Wisconsin, and no, two from Wisconsin, and one from Chicago. The, uh, uh, the, the scientists came from Wisconsin, from uh, the University of Illinois, in Champaign, and um, from Cornell, and many of them from Princeton, and uh, a few from Harvard, and I'm sure from, and of course, Berkeley and, and uh, Pasadena. No, maybe not Pasadena, I don't remember. The um, <coughs> And we tried to mix them suitably, so that they would get acquainted with each other and and form new new friendships rather than becoming clusters of individual individual universities. How did that work? Sorry. How did that work out? That worked out very well. People formed lots of new friendships, and they held. The, the, I don't remember, for instance, where uh, John Manley came from. I think from Seattle. And there were quite a few people from Seattle. Or maybe he only went to Seattle. I do not remember. The, um, the facilities in the laboratory were by no means ready. And uh, people worked very hard on getting them ready and also on getting the electricity they needed because the electricity was being manufactured on the hill and uh, it needed more and more and more of it. And so it, it was, a, if, if I remember it correctly, it was a steadily growing electric plant. And of course the people who were coming knew a lot about how to do all that. And so that was occasionally upsetting to the engineers who were in charge of, of uh, doing the work actually. The, um, the task I had as housing administrator was to see that uh, moving vans would be directed properly, that people were shown their apartments and given, shown where they would find facilities for laundry and for uh, shopping and 
uh, for their children to go to school and uh, and then also to be somewhat creative about what to do with problems. And one of the problems, for instance, was that the uh, many of the women were perfectly well capable of working in the laboratory and then their children had to be taken care of. And so uh, I think I think I have the sequence right on that. Uh, Oppenheimer brought his friend uh, Hawkins, David Hawkins, to be historian for the project. And his wife was a kindergarten teacher, mm -hmm. or even pre-kindergarten. And she organized a, a place where very small children, pre-kindergarten children, could be placed during the day. As you see, housing was very short, in short supply. And therefore, to make as many people who lived on the site work in the laboratory, to get the laboratory work done was very, very important. So all these things had to be integrated in some form or other. And it got worked out. The, uh, after a while, I got an assistant named Vera Williams. Her husband was one of the uh, leaders in, in the physics group. Wilson and Williams worked in those. And uh, then yes, in July I found myself pregnant and Hans wasn't terribly happy with my being so preoccupied at any time of day because people arrive not between nine and five, but any time, and I was expected to be available. So I gave up the job, and Vera took it over. And she stayed with it as long as she stayed in Los Alamos, which was into 46 at some point. So I didn't have to deal with the water shortage or any of the other problems <laughs> that arose later on. In, in the beginning of April, there was a big conference to determine who would be who and what the program really would would do in its sequence and what it needed and where it would expand and where it, it uh, could actually be done at, at Los Alamos. It's, I think, where Tennessee, the uh, uh, Oak Ridge was in, conceived and where the uh, Washington plant was conceived. And, well, my main recollection of that meeting, there are two of recollections. One is having the men come for their lunch and one man saying to the rest of them, they ought to listen to me. I am the oldest one among them. And he was about 42. And the other is, when uh, there, there had been long meetings and General Groves came out into the corridor and for some reason I was, I was there and said to me, well, you will be pleased. We made your husband a division leader today. And I said, well, 
he'll do it very well. And so that was the beginning, really. In, in, the, in early April, this meeting, until then, it had been all organizing. But after that, the scientific work really took off. And, uh, and I, in July, settled into domestic life. So that, shall we say, is the first chapter. Well, being in Los Alamos did not allow you to be idle. And so after I left the housing office, I offered to work at whatever they would ask. And one of the things I was asked to do was to uh, wire electronics boards for Bruno Rossi. Bruno Rossi, I knew Bruno quite well because he came from Cornell. And um, he was another, uh, we had a number of Italians there. Uh, that is three. Bruno and uh, Emilio Segre and, and uh, Enrico Fermi. Now Fermi was in and out. He came and went. He was in Chicago. He was in in in, um, in Washington. Fermi moved between Los Alamos and uh, and Washington and um, Chicago and Hanford. And uh, finally, his wife came and family came up to Los Alamos. But that was not until I don't know forty four or forty five. They weren't there for terribly long. But the fun, to go back to the housing office for one more moment, one of the fun things about the, the housing office was that I always knew who was coming. And uh, more and more of the people I knew were, were arriving, which was kind of fun. Well, the to go back to Bruno Rossi. He had a habit of um, assuming that I knew exactly what he was talking about. And so he would take a, the back of an envelope or its equivalent and say, well, I need this here and, and that there, and uh, you better use a capacitator of that strength. And um, I hadn't the faintest idea of what he was talking about. <laughs> I had majored in college in sociology and anthropology and uh, all of these things, even though I'm the daughter of a scientist and the wife of a scientist, the things have only very ephemeral uh, meaning for me. And so we gave that up. After after about a month. I think I struggled with it for a month. And then I said, Bruno, I can't do it. And since none of the other jobs were really uh, much of, of much interest or so on, so I stopped being useful and just stayed home, which meant that I had a very quiet life, but Hans had his three meals at home, and that was good for him. And then, of course, when my son arrived, I was fully occupied at home. The, um, <clears throat> I think one of the interesting things about Los Alamos is that very little of the and in fact, as far as I know, none of the work, nothing of the work that went on in the laboratory went home. And many of the women found this very difficult. Many of them didn't know what the men were working on. <laughs> 
as it happened, I knew perfectly well what Hans was working on. And uh, agreed with him that he would not talk about it. The, uh, I know that it was very difficult for many women because their husbands had talked about their work and had been, it had been a close relationship. And <clears throat> on the other hand, you know, we talked about the war, we talked about the, uh, you know, what the families were doing and all this sort of thing. But the main uh, social life took place on Sunday for us because we always went for long walks in the neighborhood and this had to be done communally because of gas shortage. So that each car was loaded full. And uh, we drove as far as across the valley or up into the Via Grande and walked from there. It was lovely. The, it was interesting and entertaining and uh, the views of course are magnificent no matter where you go as soon as you get out in the open it is just marvelous and well there were parties but I think neither Hans nor I participated in those very much one of the reasons being that we didn't really drink. We, and there was a lot of drinking going on. Not because we had any moral objections, but we just didn't. It was not part of our life to, to use wine or to use a strong drink. The parties at Oppenheimer's were always very loose in that respect. And uh, the, the public parties, so to speak, the ones at Fuller Lodge were quite alcoholic. But, but that was the time. I think it's much less now. Or maybe it's just that we are very old now. <laughs> And so alcohol doesn't actually agree with it anymore. So well, for me, the, these Sunday walks were very stimulating because I met totally new people occasionally. And uh, I enjoyed that. I didn't didn't take much part in you know, organizing Los Alamos after I dropped out of the housing office. I'm not a great organizer. So, uh, you know, you will get from other people that they were involved in this, that, and the other thing. But we are. I don't know, Hans and I were rather users than, than creators. And I found the people I met interesting and amusing. So They say that music was a, a big source, music was a big source of entertainment. Yeah, well, lots of people, but you see, music isn't, wasn't in Hans's and my life. So, the, and music was later. The people who, well, for people who played the piano or played the violin and so on, that, of course, is different. But I, and there may have been quartets and trios and so on going on everywhere. I don't know. <laughs>
and Hans was so tired at the end of the day that really all he could do was to relax and finally go to bed. And when the children were there, even that wasn't all that easy. So when were the children born? Henry was born in February 44 and Monica in June 45. So they were pretty strong. Well, now let me talk about something else which amuses me greatly. There is now a house in Los Alamos called the Beta House. Well, the No, the name come, doesn't come at the moment. We lived in it for the last three months of our time there. Until then, somebody quite different from Berkeley lived there. Mac. There was a, was it the Macmillan's house? Yes, okay. it was the Macmillan's house. Thank you. And um, I find it very sad that Macmillan isn't the name on that house because he really, you know, both he and his wife played a very important role in Los Alamos. They just didn't get the fame afterwards that Hans got. And Macmillan, I think, had the Nobel Prize. So it isn't even that they needed to pick a Nobel. <laughs> but anyway, there it is. I have nothing to do with it. Nobody cares. Can you tell us about the house? The house? Yeah. The, the better house? Yes. Well, that was one of the old school ranch houses. Ranch school houses. Um, and uh, it had a big living room and a fireplace and uh, a number of bedrooms which I've now forgotten. And then it had a kitchen and that was an interesting point because the kitchen was more elaborate than the rest of the, uh, the new kitchens. It had, in particular, a large cupboard with shelving, wooden shelving. And um, the main thing I remember about it is that one day I found my then two, two-year-old son sawing away at one of the shelves. And with what I came to know as typical for him, desperation in his voice. Mommy, it won't go all the way through. He thought it should have been a door, a yes. sort of passage. No, I didn't understand it was a closet. Yes. It was one of those wood uh, bread knives that have teeth, sharp teeth. So he had gotten about, oh, three, four inches into it. But the board was, of course, nine inches deep or so. <laughs> no. The living in the Macmillan house was mainly uh, marked by the fact that the uh, water tower was close by and those last three months September October mm, October November December were months of acute water shortage so water was brought up in tankers and then dumped in the in in this uh, water tower. But I think some of the tankers had been gasoline tankers. Mm 
and not quite, quite all the gasoline had gotten out of it. So the water was a little bit odd. And then I think they used milk tankers. And <laughs> but it meant that um, the uh, diapers, which, of which I had about 18 a day, because both, both children were still in diapers, had great difficulty getting clean because water was so restricted. And I would hang them up on a long line outside and down came the coal dust on them from the coal-fired electric plant and housing heat, house heating plants. <laughs> so by the end of December, or middle of December, I decided I'm going home. Never mind, Hans can stay here. I am going home with the children. But the problem was we didn't have a house. We had no place to stay home. Well, Hans and I had no children before we went to Los Alamos. We had rented houses. And Hans was constitutionally opposed to owning land or property. He just didn't want it. However, being a reasonable man and an accommodating man, he then agreed that we would get a house. We couldn't rent anything in Ithaca. The, uh, there were, we asked our friends to look for a house for us. And they came back and said, there are three houses for sale in Ithaca. This was end of 45, you see. People were streaming back from all over the place. And uh, two of them have to be finished. They're not quite complete. One is out on Turkey Hill Road, which is about, oh, three, four miles from the university. But in those days, it was almost clear of houses. I think there were three houses along the road. And uh, the second one is on Giles Street, and um, it smells. And they cost around $6,000, $7,000, those two houses. But then there, of course, is a very expensive one in Cayuga Heights. And that costs 20000 Well, we thought about it a long time. Well, you know, Hans was earning 6000 a year at that time. And so um, finally we said, all right, let's splurge. Mm -hmm. And we took the $20,000 house. And at that point I got the address. And I said, there is no house there. I know the people to the right and I know the people to the left. There's no house between. But of course it was there. But it was so shielded from the road by a hedge and then trees, that I was never aware of it. And we lived on it for 50 years afterwards, and quite well. So that was the end of Los Alamos for the time being. Of course, we went back, Hans went back every year, and I went back with the children when 49 for the summer, and in 52 for nine months. 52 was the time of developing the hydrogen bomb. And uh, we went back regularly until about 1957. In 57, we were mostly out in California, but 
we were back in Los Alamos as well. So life settled down in Ithaca. The most amusing story is that um, we had a friend who had a very vigorous approach to life and quite a loud voice. She was a Russian. And um, she took over Henry when I had to take Hans on a vacation because he was he needed to have the out of the office for at least two weeks. And so I parked Henry with her when he was seven months old, February to, Mar to August, it's about seven months. And um, when I got him back, he was very happy, clearly. At first it was a little strange, but then he remembered who I was. And um, about two days later, Jenya came. To, well, one of the happy aspects of Los Alamos, of course, was that since there was not much help from outside, the, the women cooperated a good deal. And uh, also, for some of the somewhat older women who did not take jobs. It, it, uh, it was, I think, quite a happy thing to, to help out with the younger ones. The, um, and so when I was going on vacation with Hans, without the child, Jenya Piles, took over looking after Henry. Henry moved into her house and uh, she had full charge of him for two weeks. Now, Jenya is a very forceful person and very opinionated. And one of the things she thinks is that children should accept. And um, so she began to feed Henry spinach Henry, of course, knocked it out of her hand first. So she wrapped him in a diaper with his arms confined and started to feed him. So he spit it at her. And uh, every time he did one of these things, she would say strongly, no. Well, when I got back and Henry returned to me and Jenya came two days later to see whether I, whether I was undoing all the good she had done for Henry. Henry gave one look at her, and it was his first word. No, he said. <laughs> and he, he, he would have nothing to do with her. We visited the piles later in Birmingham when they had returned to England. And it was no better relation. <laughs> I mean, Henry knew how to behave by then, but he surely didn't like her. <laughs> One of the women living in our house we, we had a we, we were in one unit of a four unit house and uh, one of the other women had had a baby very shortly after Henry Henry had weighed seven pounds that baby had weighed nine pounds and it showed for the whole two years that we lived together that baby was always two steps behind, behind, I mean, ahead of what Henry was doing. Um, it was my first lesson in how a long intrauterine life 
is useful. It had come very late. That boy came, I think, two weeks late or something like that. Whereas Henry came early. So, well, what else can I tell you about that? I can tell you, of course, the story which Harold Agnew told at um, Hans's memorial service, which was that uh, it was very dangerous to come home when Henry was about, oh, a year old, a little more, because he would be out on the porch and the porch was over the stairs which led up to Agnew's apartment, which was on the same level as ours. And um, he said, Henry would stand there and he always lost his diaper. <laughs> it was dangerous to get up those stairs. <laughs> but um, maybe that's not a story that should go down to eternity. <laughs> So, um, well, to get back, the company we enjoyed most Sundays were um, the Weisskopfs, the Flanders, uh, possibly Fermi, and uh, Occasionally, um, never mind. Well, occasionally other people would join in. And uh, this was great fun. Conversation was always on a good, good level, never about work, unless the men were separating themselves. And um, it was always dangerous to pick up on anything that you found strange. So I wondered one, one time why Fermi was singing so happily about the 49ers. I still don't know what that was about. But all the men knew and agreed that it was very happy, the 49ers. So uh, we organized, uh, no, that was much later. That was in 1952, when we organized trips where one car would, uh, would go uh, one place and another car would go another place, and the people in it would swap keys in the middle. But they were the trips were as short as possible because we we really didn't have the gas. And one was very conscious of the, the lack of various things, which produced a happy hour because the army could get really good beef. And so from time to time, there were steak nights in the cafeteria, and um, that really made the men happy. I remember one time standing in line together with uh, Oppenheimer and von Neumann, and Oppenheimer asked von Neumann what he was going to have, whether he liked his steak rare or well, von Neumann said, I like it very well done. Oh, said Oppie, you might as well take the fish. <laughs> so, <laughs> the, well, do I have other nice little anecdotes? <laughs> 
Some, do you remember any um, parties at the Oppenheimer's house and what they might have served or what you? Well, I remember them, but not any, anything that's particularly terrible. I don't remember conversations there, except at one time with Kitty, who um, was somehow trying to, to tell me something about her German background. And I don't really know what she was trying to tell me, except that it was there and that it was related to the to Rommel, I think. She had uh, uncles or something like that in, in a very high up military rank in Germany. But that, all that you can get elsewhere. It's not, I, I don't. In none of her stories are, to me, very memorable, so I'd rather not go into that. Let me try and remember another one of those. This is a Captain Parsons story, but I, I can't put it together at the moment. And was at the end of the war. The of course, I had a lot to do with the pediatrician. Uh, Opie, in a very foresighted moment, had uh, recruited, uh, well, he had, a, he had recruited a radiologist from St. Louis, I think, Louis Hempelman. And uh, Louis was a doctor, but uh, specialized on radiology. And it, so Louis was asked whether he would please bring a doctor uh, and uh, two doctors up to the site. And he chose an, uh, uh, one pediatrician and one uh, gynecologist. Both of them joined the army and were now under military aegis. Um, the, uh, and so were the nurses. I mean, that whole hospital was a military hospital, which was very convenient for us because it cost 30, 83 cents a day. And the, Medical attention was free. So it was a very cheap way to have children. However, uh, Henry, never mind, I'll remember his name in a while. Uh, the pediatrician was a very up to date pediatrician. And he said, the most important thing for you when Monica was born is now to make sure that Henry will be all right. Monica will be okay, but Henry will have trouble. <laughs> Indeed, Henry had trouble. But Monica had much more trouble. She uh, somehow didn't digest the milk properly. And I think I was overworked by that time. And um, the uh, 
the milk wasn't much good. So I was to, to keep Monica on mother's milk. But um, I decided that child is hungry. She cried and cried and cried all the time. Well, so I put her on formula, and after that she calmed down. But while she cried so much, it got Henry upset, of course. It got Hans upset, it got me upset. The whole household was in disorder. Well, Henry got neglected. He was not yet walking. He was 16 months old, but he wouldn't walk. He could crawl at an incredible speed. And one day I noticed that his crawling had changed. And it wasn't until several days later that I realized that he had a splinter in one knee. Well, there it was, but he got him up on his feet. So, well, what else funny occurs to me? You mentioned um, occasionally you went to Edith Warner's tea house. Ah, oh, we went down to Miss Warner. It, it, well, there were several occasions. The Oppenheimers took you down to Miss Warner, and uh, I think we went down with them twice. But then, when Monica was imminent, I was given a baby shower, and that was down at Miss Warner's, and was very sweet. She produced something, I forget what, oh, very nice. Oh, and, and you know, she had this old Indian living with her. And uh, he produced an arrowhead, which was a, I wonder where that is. I've totally forgotten where I have put that. Uh, it was an arrowhead that was to be a decoration for the, for the child. Of course, we didn't know what we would get, you know. No, mama, grandma, whatever you do. No, um, so, <clears throat> it, but that was very sweet. I, I don't really remember very much. We were, I went down to Miss Warner and got something from her fairly regularly. And I forget what it was. Well, memory is an odd thing. It will hit on something and not on others. Can you describe her, um, where she lived and her tea room? Oh, look, there are books available by I Miss know, Warner and on her. Well, anyway, if you have the, the um, well, she lived by the river and, uh, you know, I'm sorry, but Miss Warner was not an important part of my life. It was an important part of a number of people's lives, but not of mine. So let's let her rest in peace. Sure. sure. How about um, you'd mentioned uh, that occasionally you remember going to Santa Fe. You remember going to Santa Fe. Oh. I don't think anything exciting happened. So that no. was not a big deal? No. You know. It was a big deal in the sense that you didn't go very often. And uh, in the beginning, I had to go down a number of times because I needed equipment. And one of the equipments I needed was an electric uh, 
uh, uh, in electric um, uh, toaster oven, shall we say, something of that kind. But it wasn't that. It was a uh, it it was a big pot in which you could make soup and could make um, stews, things of that kind. No, it wasn't a toaster oven. I did make fires in that big black beauty. Uh -huh. And you cooked on the top I of it? I cooked on it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I was used to, to uh, the stove like that because my grandmother had one. She lived in a, in a village in Bavaria and uh, she had a great big one with four openings and a big basin in which hot water was made and all the dishwashing water and all the sort of incidental hot water came out of there. And so you knew how to manage with that, with the stove. You knew how to manage with a uh, big stove like that. I think many of the other wives had an experience. Some of them were very unhappy about yeah. it. But um, I knew how to lay a fire in it and all that. So it was, for me, it was not a big deal. It was inconvenient. The children had to be kept away from it. But they learned very quickly what was hot and what was not. You know, you touch it once and it's the end. So, but uh, I had to get some kind of furniture into that kitchen and uh, there were other things that had to be bought down there. So in the beginning I made quite a number of trips to Santa Fe and later I didn't. In, when we lived there in 52, I went down to Santa Fe very frequently and for amusement and to visit friends and things of this kind, but, but not in the beginning. I remember the now suddenly the uh, honestly. Sorry. I can't remember their name at the moment. There were people who came uh, to the theory department and later on he was in charge of theory. K. Mark. The Marks. Carson and K. K. had four children. One of them still not walking. He retired last year. He lived all his life in Los Alamos. He went to to university and then returned to to um, Los Alamos as an employee. Um, Kay lived in in one of the McKay houses. I think that's what they were called. McGee? Hmm? McGee? They were very small. It, yeah. Right. Yeah. And she had these four children in there. Well, how do you transport four children? She had a little wagon with staves on the side, and she arranged those children in that wagon and pulled it. And uh, then, of course, later they got a better house. Then they built a house then up on, on, on the, uh, what was known as the horse meadow in my time. 
so do you, did you do any skiing? Had they built had they built the ski hill when you were? Ah, uh, well, it'll, I went skiing once when I was very pregnant. It wasn't very successful. Hans went skiing a number of times. But um, it was, Another one of the Russians. He came from Harvard. He went back to Harvard. Oh, Kiskikowski? George Kiskikowski? He came from Harvard. He was a Russian. He, he used the Maybe. dynamite to clear the trees. Maybe. No? I, I forget. He built that, that slope, essentially, but we only used it. I think there's a photograph of Hans skiing. Quite possibly. Yeah. Yeah. No, you see, once, once I had the children, really, I was very occupied, and there there was no way of doing such things. For a long time, I also didn't go on the walks. It, uh, it really, it changed life totally for me to, uh, to have those two children. Great joy. <laughs> There, there was a baby boom on the site, right? There must have been a lot of other yeah. young mothers with... Yeah, very... lots of young mothers. And uh, some women who were longing for children and couldn't get pregnant. And I think the altitude, while it helped me, it was difficult for other people. I had been married after all for four years by then, five years. And uh, really, we wanted children. Hans was, after all, not all that young. He was 38 when Henry was born. Was he? Yeah, approximately. How old were you? Well, 44 minus 17. You make the calculation. Okay. Okay. 27 then. Yeah. yeah. Yes, and I was 28 when Monica was born. I think. That was very close. Mm -hmm. I remember traveling to uh, back to New York when Henry was Eight months to eight, eight months along, little, little, yeah, approximately that, because my brother was going overseas, and that was the only excuse anybody had for going home. So I went to New York and stayed with the Piles, who were then working at Columbia, and. Uh, Virginia told me afterwards that she worried all the way home for me that I would have that baby <laughs> on the train. <laughs> well, I didn't. It was the end of February when Henry came. <laughs> you wanted me to talk about my origins, so to speak. I was born in Munich in 1917, which was the middle of the, the first real starvation year of, in Germany in the First World War. 
My father was on the front in, in Russia, and my mother was in Munich. She had an older child, about two and a half, and uh, he had come home. In fact, uh, apart from my older brother, you can trace when my father came home on leave. <laughs> <laughs> and um, the uh, I, I am told that I was a very puny child, very wrinkled and very ugly. And the story is that my one of my grandmothers said that the child looks just like you to the other grandmother. And then apparently, a little later, she said, well, it's not a very pretty looking child, is it? And the, my mother's mother, who uh, was supposed to look just like me, said, you are a fine one. First you say the child looks just like me, and then you say it's an ugly child. <laughs> so that was my beginning. But um, I grew up, and I filled out, not, not very soon. I filled out in, as a teenager. Until then, I was kind of little nothing. And um, the joy of, of our lives in those years was that my, my father's mother had built herself a house out in the country. And uh, when the war broke out, she said, this is going to be a long war, and it's going to be a hungry war. And she built a barn and bought a cow. And the, uh, she turned her whole garden into a, into a food garden. It was a big potato field and uh, all vegetables that she could think of. And, uh, uh, fruit bushes, that is, uh, raspberries and blackberries and so on. And um, the garden got planted completely. The rest of the garden got planted with apple trees and plum trees and things like that. And one enormous, what, what became an enormous walnut tree. Lovely. Well, this meant that we were quite well fed through all these hunger times. But when my mother was in Munich, this was not so. So she spent quite a bit of time out in the country. And um, came the end of the war, the, uh, my father, who had uh, run a radio uh, an x-ray station for the medical corps uh, came home he was a, he, he had gotten his phd in uh, in crystallography x-ray crystallography which was then not yet a field and became a specialty afterwards. So uh, he was now in need of a job. And the job offered was in Stuttgart, which is a southwestern German city, at that time still quite small, 
I think under 100,000 people. And um, he, it was the same story as when we wanted to return to Ithaca. He couldn't find an apartment. So we were taken out to the countryside to my grandmother, and we spent a year in Upper Bavaria on a lake in the country. And that was a very happy time. And then in the spring of uh, 1922, we moved to Stuttgart into an apartment that had been created out of a two apartment house. That is, there were two floors, two center floors, which were the living area and entertaining area of the house, and the then the attic floor and the basement floor were the bedroom floors. Now the owner of the house kept the the uh, first floor and the basement, but the second floor got made into a separate apartment and separate from the attic floor. And we got this middle apartment, which had um, three large rooms, one middle-sized room, one fairly small room, and a kitchen. And um, the way my parents divided it up was that um, my father got as a study the smaller of the, what I can only call uh, salon rooms. The center rooms became the living room, and the biggest of them all became my parents' bedroom. And then next to my parents' bedroom was the children's room. And all four of us by then slept in that room. But it served not only for our bedroom and playroom, but it served also as the bathroom. It had a bathtub in it and, and a gas heater for the hot water, and a little uh, Franklin's type stove to heat the room. The other rooms were heated by a uh, so-called kachel oven. Um, the, what do you call this when tile. it's made out of uh, ceramic. ceramic? A ceramic tile? Yeah. yeah. They, they were ceramic tile stoves, and uh, we kept fires going in them. The, um, the wonder to me later in life was that none of us got burnt by the hot stove, and none of us ever turned that gas valve and killed ourselves with gas poisoning. To which I got a slight clue by remembering that when I was about 10 or 11, I visited a friend of my parents and uh, helped her bathe her baby. The baby was then three, I think, and he had been happily splashing about in the bathtub, but now it was time to come out, and he didn't want to, of course. And he, he was showered down by, by a warm shower 
And his mother said, I'll turn on the cold if you don't come out. Well, he didn't come out, and I turned on the cold. And this friend said to my mother afterwards, you do keep your children on a short leash, don't you? <laughs> So I think that's why we never turned on that gas, because it had been made that dangerous to us and that punishable. That whole apartment, by the way, had one toilet in, in a narrow, I don't think that room was wider than that. And it contained a rack for coats. There was a door between the coat rack and the toilet. But um, it had coats hanging in there, and it had the one wash basin to wash one's hands. It, um, I think of what we consider an appropriate apartment in this country. And I lived in that apartment for 16 years. I grew up in it completely. Had a front entrance and a back entrance. And um, the front entrance was wonderful. It was a staircase that was, oh, half the size of this room. And in it were hanging pictures. Our landlord, was a dealer in oriental rugs. And he had bought pictures of musicians, of, of uh, Iranian Persian musicians. And they, they hung in the hallway of the, of the entrance. So, it, you know, and we could ride down the, the banister of the stairs. <laughs> Now that I think of it, I, I'd shudder because we would have fallen two floors. I mean, when, anyway, I also went out on the, on, on the uh, gutter of that house at one time because we had thrown a ball and it had gotten all the way up into the gutter. And, you know, balls were not a plentiful thing for us. So I had climbed out a window and gone into the gutter and gone all along to the corner and picked up that ball. I mean, but that was before I gained weight. So life had its high points and low points. The, uh, there was a big garden around that apartment in Stuttgart, which also had been partly turned into a nourishing garden during the war. With, uh, but it was landscaped with this. With, uh, stand up uh, gooseberry bushes along the drive where the carriages could come up and discard their, their passengers directly into that grand entrance, you see. And uh, oh, there were currant bushes, black currant, red currant. There were some strawberries. There was a pear tree of the little tiny pears that are ripe for 10 minutes in the... Well, you know, they're hard until they're ripe. And then they're absolutely delicious. They have taste, they're sweet, and they have the right consistency. But you look at them a day later and they're gone. They've become mulchy and very gone. Well, and there was a cherry tree. And since the, grand, the landlord didn't have any children at that time, 
we had the, the climbing of those trees. So it was a good life. The other side of the house was a um, decorative garden, landscape for beauty. It had a little pond in it with fish. And when we learned to ride bicycles, that pond was a great hazard. And my sister fell into it once off the bicycle. <laughs> Stuttgart was a fun city. Next door to us lived the deposed king. That is, he didn't live next door to us, but his vineyard was next door to us. And uh, that actually brings up a very, very bad memory because when in 1933 the Nazis were after the king and uh, they swarmed the, uh, an SA group to swarm through our garden to climb across the fence into the orchard and into the vineyard and go down the slope to his house, to the king's house. And uh, that was a time of extreme uh, fear for us because we were there. We didn't know whether they were after us we didn't know what their purpose was in coming into the garden. But then they disappeared in, into the king's garden. So that was, but that's much later. I mean, I was 16 when Hitler came to power. So there are 16, well, anyway, 12 years of living in that house and growing up. So, what else? Oh, it, you were only 10, right, when you first... You were only 10 years old when you first met Hans, is that right? I was um, 29, I was going on 12. Uh -huh. Can you... Do you remember meeting him? Oh, yes. No, I remember that very well because he came, as it is, I don't remember the very first time I met him, but he was a, a fairly frequent dinner guest. And he was very hungry. So. <laughs> what was he doing at the time? He must have been 22 or three. He had just got his PhD and this, and had gone to back to Frankfurt, where he had begun his studies as an assistant to somebody. But he didn't like that job. He, the, that man wasn't really interested in the same things that he, Hans, was interested in. So when my father offered to have him as an, as on a fellowship of some sort, I forget what, uh, he came to Stuttgart. Hans had done his PhD on a different aspect of what my father had done. And so, so they were interested in each, each other's work. But the, um, and then of course he got a job as an, as, an, as an extraordinary professor. That's the first rank. Now, you, you then become an ordinary, uh, well, you move up over two stages. And you know, he stayed, oh, well, the story is that um, Professor Sommerfeld, who was the, what we call in German, the doctor father of both 
Hans and, and my father, uh, wrote to my father, Hans is my property. Send him back to me immediately. <laughs> A postcard. And um, so, and it was from there that he got the job in Tübingen. But then on the 1st of April, 1933, he lost that job because the uh, uh, edict came out that only pure Aryans could be employed by the state. And in Germany, all universities are state universities. So he went back to Munich and um, then with the help of some of it, found employment in Manchester in England. In, which was very happy for him in a way because one of his, uh, his friends while he was working on his PhD had been Woody Piles who was working on his PhD. And uh, Woody had moved earlier already to Manchester. So Hans moved in with the Piles, who had a small baby. Gen um, Jenya left the, the baby, who was by then a year old approximately, with Hans to watch her. She could walk. She could also sort of babble, you know, this, that, and the other and sound. And Hans had the impression that the child thought she was in charge of Hans. Because every once in a while, she would come up to his knees and tell him something. And then she would be perfectly satisfied with whatever his response and go back to what she had been doing. <laughs> so as you can see, the looking after each other's children it was not all that strange for Jenya to do. Jenya had, I had met Jenya uh, in 19, well, I was in Europe visiting my parents in Cambridge uh, in 39. And so when Hans and I got engaged in 39, I went to the Piles to tell them that I was going to marry their favorite boy. And Jenya looked at me very sternly and said, now don't undo all the good I have done with him. As you can see, a forceful lady. In 1940, we offered to take the Piles children. You know, England was evacuating its children to uh, Canada and America. And uh, I remember meeting this oldest child and the next one. Uh, at the time, I told Jenya that I was going to get married to Hans. And those two children came into the room, the older one holding the hand of the younger one. They were by then several years old. I forget how old. Maybe she was the... What is her name? Um, anyway, she may have been five. She was holding her little brother's hand and she looked at her mother and said, may we wash our hands? Well, I was scared stiff of those children, but nevertheless, I offered to, to take them. 
that you can see. <laughs> well, this, these are all anecdotes about Genya, which I think have no, not appeared anywhere. I was in my fifth year in the gymnasium in high school when Hitler came to power. He came to power on the 30th of January, 1933. The school year in Germany ended on the 1st of April, and um, there was a vacation. We returned from that vacation, and I found a, a noticeable change in the atmosphere of my school in the way various classes were being taught. One was the history class, which was taught by the daughter of um, an admiral, who was by then probably, oh, in her 40s. She suddenly didn't speak didn't come through straight forward anymore, at least to my ears. The, uh, all in Germany, all children have to take uh, religious instruction in school. You can get it as a Lutheran, you can get it as a Catholic or as a Jew. Well, I was in the general Lutheran instruction group. And instead of having the philosophy professor from the, the high school, the boys' high school, uh, who was teaching the religion classes in, in that, uh, we suddenly had somebody, somebody else. He turned out to be a Nazi. And his main aim was to tell us that the Jews were Jews and they had killed Christ and they were awful people. That was essentially his message. We were supposed to get the first year of philosophy at that point. The last three years of the high school are taught by people who are philosophers. They may be also priests or ministers, but they're, they are not supposed to be teaching basic religion anymore. It's comparative religion, philosophy of religion, things of that kind. And here was this man. You know, week after week after week came this particular piece of information. And um, one of my friends, a Jewish girl, found that she was being uh, uh, propositioned, let us say, by the physics teacher, by the science teacher. Uh, and I found them one day standing at the window in the physics lab with his arm around her. There was nothing she could do. Absolutely nothing. I mean, if she really refused, it was dangerous for her family. And um, it turned out that this man was a rela uh, relation, and I don't quite know how close, of Goebbels. So he felt free to act as he pleased. She later told me, this friend later told me that the director also propositioned her. We were by then, as I say, 16. So you say, I didn't feel exactly either, well, you know, I knew 
well, I also was subjected to some teasing by my uh, classmates. Just various, being called names. The, uh, so I just wouldn't have it. I dropped out of school in two years before I should have. And um, I managed to get to England. Now, this, uh, I managed that by asking people who came to visit whether they could find me something in England, some job. I was perfectly willing to scrub floors. It didn't matter to me. And. Don't, you know, one has very little notion about what life is about at 16 when one has grown up in a sort of genteel uh, upper bourgeois type of background. One just doesn't know. The, uh, one was used to helping in the house, but it was helping. It was not that you had to scrub the floor every day. On the contrary, if you had homework to do, the homework took precedence over anything else. So I asked people, and we had an, quite a number of visitors from England, and this one happened to be uh, in some vague form related to us. My the, the Jewish component of my family is very complicated because my father uh, married a once removed cousin. So my, uh, my maternal grandmother was fully Jewish, my uh, paternal grandmother was half Jewish, and the same family. So it, it's very complicated, and <laughs> we've often figured out the percentage, which was kind of fun. Well, this particular relation of the Phillips on family had moved to England and married an Englishman, and uh, it was she who uh, well, she had actually died, but she had companions, and it was these companions who visited us and then invited me to come and stay with them. And so I got to Glasgow in uh, 1934, and I stayed in England for nine months, learned English. I went to uh, secretarial school and learned shorthand in English, which is based on pronunciation. So I had to learn the pronunciation. And I got a nice Scottish accent in, in my English at that time. Well, at the end of three months, I went south and looked for work. And I tried to get into a nursing school, but I was too young, 17. And um, then another relation discovered that a friend of hers had a boarding school where a scullery maid was needed. And I was asked to go there with the promise I would be working in in the nursery, and uh, not at all in the scullery. But in the end, it was the scullery. And I didn't like it. They didn't particularly like me because I didn't offer great compliance. And uh, I was much closer to some of the girls who were there. It, it was a boarding school for troubled children. 
the little boys were very clever, seven-year-olds, eight-year-olds. I remember one of them being punished. But unfortunately, whoever invented that particular punishment didn't realize that toilet paper was stored in the room to which he was confined. That toilet paper went all out the window. <laughs> All I could think was good for you. <laughs> so you see, I didn't really fit in there. I went home. And uh, so I went to secretarial school in, uh, in German. And then I got a job in Stuttgart. The uh, woman who placed me he said, well, you're not terribly good at the new shorthand, but I think maybe this job will, shoot, will be okay. Well, it was a job to type the same letter 50 times. Well, you know, there were no multi multiplying machines where you could not tell whether it was an original or a copy. So they had to be all originals. And they, it was the beginning of street lights, street amples, you know, uh, traffic lights. He was selling traffic lights to the little villages and small towns of the neighborhood. Each one got his own faultlessly typed letter by me. Well, the uh, people in Glasgow came through with an offer of an au pair position in France. Nobody they knew in England could do it, but the lady in France had a boarding house for young girls and she also had an adopted little boy who needed to be supervised in his homework in French and he needed to be taken, walked to school and picked up and all sorts of interesting things. Well, I went to Nîmes, but as I was saying goodbye to my 50 letters, the man looked at me in complete uh, disbelief. He said, now you are leaving Germany just when we got the Saarland back? Now this doesn't mean anything to you, but at the end of World War I, France grabbed most of the coal and steel areas of Germany because they were adjacent. And the Saarland was one of those. And Hitler just readopted it. <laughs> and he put the mil he he restarted the military, you see, which had been also kept very, very low by the Allies. It was all the Treaty of Versailles, which really was not a good treaty. It was a stupid treaty. And um, <clears throat> so I said, yes, yes, the Saarland. So, and I went to Nîmes. And I had two months in Nîmes. In the meantime, uh, the, uh, I had managed to interest somebody in possibly getting me to the United States, and he came through. So my parents called me back to Stuttgart, and I got a visa and uh, came to the United States. I landed on the 30th of April, 1936, in about 90 degree heat at midnight. 
Where did you land? In New York. In New York was 90 at midnight. 90 degree Fahrenheit, mm. not 90 degree yeah. centigrade. Right. But 90 degree Fahrenheit on the docks in New York City is quite warm. I had spent the whole day, we had landed early in the morning, I had spent the whole day waiting to get off and was one of the very last people off. Why? Because I was a single girl, 19 years old, and um, they didn't want me to go into the sex trade. So it had to be a certain ascertained is the way to say it, um, that um, I was going legitimately and that the people who were picking me up were not, uh, yeah, he was a professor at NYU, so, um, <laughs> but we could prove that his wife was a cousin of mine. <laughs> So finally, I was allowed to leave the boat. Yeah, that was the introduction to America. The authorities will take care of you. So from then on, I was here. My first position, my first position was to look after the children of my host family and uh, for the summer. And somebody who had an estate in, uh, well, near New Rochelle, where they were living, in one of the other Westchester towns. Uh, and uh, we were to to have, uh, they had a child too, and we were to uh, play five days a week on that estate. There were several more children, which was all very lucky for me. And, um, but that wouldn't go on for the year, you see. That was a summer job. The. Um, You know, it's very funny. I didn't realize it at the time at all. But the physics community is a very closed uh, community. And at that time, there were maybe 2,000 of them all over the world. And they all knew each other. And so I was handed from one physicist to another physicist, another physicist. And uh, the, um, the lady in North Carolina, a Dr. Hertha Sponer, had been an assistant to Professor James Funk. And uh, it was Funk who knew that she needed a housekeeper. So I went there as her housekeeper getting thoroughly instructed by her how to do it. Very useful. I knew how to scrub a bathtub after that, and I knew how to, to cook in a North German way. So it was OK. But I found North Carolina troublesome because of its color problems. And I found Duke University, which was then two separate schools. There was the boys' section and the girls' college. Um, I found that girls' college really very strange because, for one thing, they had to be in at 9 o'clock, I think. Well, at Smith College later on, we had to be in by 10, so it was okay. But by then, I was used to this sort of thing. And um, 
Monday night was study night. Now I asked, don't you have to study other evenings too, other days? Well, she said, it's different. Monday night is study night. You can't have dates. But what is a date? A date is when you are with a boy more than 59 minutes. When you go to town, you have to wear stockings and gloves and a hat. So all of this struck me as so ridiculous. And then the instruction, you do not talk to black people. You worry about them. They are dangerous. Why go from Germany, where the Jews are dangerous, to North Carolina, where the blacks are dangerous? So I asked with my friends in New Rochelle whether they could recommend a northern college for me. They had all determined that I had to go to college, not that I had been a good student. I had barely squeezed through. So, however, I got to Smith College by, you know, somebody knowing somebody, somebody, somebody. And um, I saw the, um, of what was, well, what was essentially the dean. She was known as something else. I forget now what. It, it, what do you call him? The person in charge in the prison. Provost? Was she the provost? Hmm? Provost? No, no, no. no. A children. It, of children. A person in charge of in a, a house mother. Or hmm? a house mother? Was she? No, no, no. House, house mother is a very low position. Okay. <laughs> she was in charge of. In never mind. Yeah, anyway, she had the title that is normally known for for a prison warden. In a women's college, in a women's prison. Anyway, she was discussing with me what courses and what level I would fit into. Now, mind you, I was very aware that I had dropped out of college, out of high school, two years early, and that I had gotten a better leaving, uh, uh, what do you call it, certificate. Uh, than I really deserved. So, but she said, no, no, don't, uh, you went to a very demanding school, and that I did. I mean, it, it prepares you for the university, and that's a pretty good thing in, in a German, in generally in European education. And um, you had, you studied history, and you studied geography, and I see you had a biology class, and you learned botany and zoology, and um, then you had religious instruction. It's all very good. I think we'll consider you a sophomore. Half a year at Duke, where they didn't, they put me into remedial uh, classes for English and uh, generally considered me a remedial student, foreigner who doesn't know English. And um, so I stayed at Smith College, but Hans was determined that he would marry me. And uh, the uh, career at Smith College ended after two years with getting a degree from Smith and from Cornell, which means I get requests for supporting both Smith and Cornell. However, Duke University has forgotten me, and isn't that lucky? Hans knew Edward 
in Munich because Edward spent part of a term, I think, in Munich. But then he got run over by a streetcar and lost one foot. Yes, that was a very sad thing and explains a lot about him. Um, he did what we all did, namely to jump up on the moving streetcar, only he didn't make it. So apparently, Hans was the only person from that rather close circle of the Sommerfeld students who bothered to go and visit him. And uh, while the visit wasn't very long, and I don't think was very talkative, it touched Edward deeply. And Hans was glad he had done it. And so when they both found themselves in this country, and um, it, Edward began to organize meetings. Edward and Hans, I think, immigrated the same year, 35. So it, it, Hans got invited to those. And he stayed with Edward, then Mitzi. Edward had gotten married in the meantime. Mitzi was a very young bride. And um, it grew into a really close friendship. And the friendship withstood the problems of Los Alamos, where Edward kept pushing for the hydrogen bomb, and Hans was in charge of getting the nuclear bomb, the atomic bomb, going. And Edward just, he occasionally would deliver some calculations. But you know, he, he didn't really truly participate and do the tasks that had to be done. And, and uh, uh, Opie finally separated him as a separate group gave him two students to work with him. I think Bob Christie and somebody else. But Christie also worked on the, on, on the atomic bomb uh, and had one of the basic ideas for it. So, you know, but we saw the tellers, we had good times with them in Los Alamos. The split came when Edward insisted on the uh, hydrogen bomb. And um, insisted that America needed to develop it into what it did develop into. So that's why, but before that, they were very good friends. And they had a fondness for each other afterwards, but they couldn't talk to each other because they would immediately come to the split in ideology. It was sad. We visited the Taylors once in Stanford and found it very lucky that Edward was not there, and so we could see Mitzi. <laughs> but their lives were in odd ways intertwined. Hans needed a neck operation late in life, well, in the 80s. And uh, I think it was in the 80s. I've forgotten pretty much the timetable of it. And um, nobody would touch it. The local person wouldn't touch it. The man in Syracuse wouldn't touch it. The man in Harvard wouldn't touch it. But finally, somebody in Pittsburgh did. <laughs> 
he was willing to look at it and operate it. Hans was losing the use of his left arm. And um, after a while we found out that Mitzi needed, she had trigeminus, I think it's called, it's a nerve here. She had problems with that and it needed operation. And the same man did it. They were living in Pasadena, no, Berkeley. And we were <laughs> living in Ithaca. But we met, so to speak, in <laughs> Pittsburgh. These are sort of the nice little incidents in life. You should read Hans's review of Edward's autobiography and what he what he says about Edward. It's a very very nice review. Already in the last year of the war, I would say, the, when it was clear that the Americans would be victorious, um, or at least when the, the hope was high, um, the people here began to plan for post-war. And um, <clears throat> there were at Los Alamos Robert Barker and Hans and um, McDaniel and um, oh, two or three more people from, oh, many more five more people from here. Well, two of them, one was a doctor and another one was um, an engineer of some sort. All the others were physicists. Um, well, they knew that they would have to somehow plan so there was a big meeting to which Bob Barker and Hans and uh, a man named Lloyd Smith and the then department head, whose name escapes me at the moment, uh, were all coming together here. Physics has, as you may know by now, many divisions. There is our physics, physics, theoretical, and even in theoretical physics, there are now many divisions. Then there is uh, experimental physics, and again, many divisions. And um, there, there is engineering physics. And the great question was, which of these branches would Cornell develop? The uh, Barker was a big machine man. He had uh, he had gotten the first tiny synchrotron. Uh, uh, what's the basic machine called? It's not the a synchrotron. Hmm? The cyclotron or the accelerator? Yeah, an accelerator. Uh, from uh, Berkeley here to Cornell, and they ran that with experiments all the time. So, in addition to that, theory had suddenly become great. It was a very obscure little runt of a something before the war, before the Second World War, but it was great after. And so <laughs> this all had to be somehow worked out. And uh, the, the basic rivals were Lloyd Smith, who was an electrical 
engineer. No, he was a physicist, but with electrical engineering, engineering physics. And Bob Barker, who was an experimental physicist, and wanted to build a big machine. So that, and they got, money was no problem. Government would give money, the government would give money the, uh, the academy would give money, the university would give money. In money they were swimming. <laughs> so, but they had to make it bright. And um, it, what they did was to be really very intelligent. They formed a triumvirate of experimental, engineering and science and theory. And those three men worked out what they would do here. The two others had known each other forever because they they had one had grown up here in the department got his the department used to replenish itself out of its own PhDs. But with Hans coming, that changed. He, I think he was the first not locally grown professor. So they built the, the nuclear lab and uh, the, um, the people in Los Alamos, the theorists, came to get their PhD, many of them came to get their PhD with Hans. And you know, the theory revision consisted of people who had only a high school education, but were good at mathematics. Others had a college education, but nothing further. And so they fitted in very nicely. And uh, for the first years, until about 1952, 1950, we were, there were any number of Los Alamos people. But McDaniel, uh, why can I think only of McDaniel? There were four, four people from here who came with Barker, who were his students. And, um, then there was a man named Kaikendal, who also had come from here and returned here and had students. Um, there was Parrot. It's a P-A-R-R-A-T, not an O-T. <laughs> and he had, had brought one or two students. So it, there was this tremendous return and some new ones. Uh, why did, why did um, Feynman come? I think Feynman simply came because we needed another man. And he liked the idea of coming with Hans. It seems to me the Manhattan Project grows with every time I hear about it. I, I was so... They were very good at uh, making people keep their mouth shut. Of course, it didn't help them because Fuchs was passed by the British and taken over. Whether they had discovered Fuchs is very questionable. I mean, whether they would have. He was very canny. And his parents in Germany were not liked by the Nazis. So his father was a 
a bishop, I think. Not a Catholic one, a Protestant one. We do have these hierarchies, but I, I'm not quite sure what the title would be. So did you know uh, Klaus Fuchs? I, did I know whom? Did you know Fuchs? Fuchs? Fuchs. Sure. Well, he was part of the, part of the social life. But you see, the piles guaranteed for him. They had known him for ever since he came out of Germany. And he presented himself as a refugee, as he was indeed, because he was a communist. And communists were also not welcome. But um, <clears throat> Communism was not as um, revolting to, I think, I shouldn't say most Europeans, but I think anybody was um, not blind to the economic situation of the past hundred years. New Marx uh, literature and uh, found in it a lot of things that were simply true. This did not make people pro-Russian. The Russian Revolution was not really a communist revolution. It was much closer to the sort of state that had come about in, in Germany. What do you remember about Niels Bohr? Well, I met the Niels Bohr only at that in Los Alamos. I met him. No, by the time I came, no, one year he was still there when I went to, to Denmark. But later, when I came to Denmark, he had died. I remember his wife scaring me to bits. I had brought her a flower, and she insisted on climbing up some steps in the kitchen to reach the particular vase she wanted to put the flowers in. And she was well in her 90s by then. And I, being 20 years younger, was scared stiff. She would fall. I now climb the ladder perfectly happily. <laughs> <laughs>